Okay, it's time to begin our evening service. If you're visiting with us, thank you. You're an honored guest. We hope you come back to see us and also take the time to fill out a visitor's card. You can leave it in the pew or give it to a member. And if you have a cell phone or any other electronic device, you can silence that at this time so it don't become a distraction during service. Sick or in the hospital, we have Beth McCullum is confined at home after a fall. She was treated uh, for her injuries from yesterday. <clears throat> Teresa Tatum is sick at home with a UTI. Betty Padilla is confined at home with sinus problems. We have a lot of special prayer requests in our bulletin for friends and family members suffering with cancer and various illnesses. Please remember these in your prayers. December, December 5th through 19th, we will be collecting donations for holiday meals for needy families from East Ridge Elementary. There's a cookie bake and soup potluck planned for Friday, December 17th at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Bring your cookie, dough, decorations, and favorite soup. See Morgan Paris for questions. Also in the foyer, there is a sign-up sheet for the communion and also for the uh, greeters for 2022, and it's posted on the board there on the wall. Please pick a month and sign up for one of those assignments there. <clears throat> Uh, the 2021 November report from Sergey Boyko is on the four is in the four year on the table. You can pick up one of those if you want to read it. And tonight our first prayer is Rick Rutherford. Closing prayer will be Tony Paris. Scripture reading will be Reggie Carter and Bob Garrett will be leading us in song. We'll be looking at Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians chapter 1, we'll begin with verse 9 and reading some verses. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for the patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Before I begin, I have a short announcement, and a sense of dread came over the congregation. Holiday meals. The bags and lists of needed food items for the holiday meals for families at East Ridge Elementary School are now available in the foyer. Please take a bag and return the purchased items to the Fellowship Hall table by Sunday, December 19th. If you prefer to donate money rather than shop, please see Paula Cheryl Colts Garrett, M-A-C-C-C, S-L-P. -C -C 300, let's start with 300. I have a friend and this is his absolute all-time favorite song.
For our prayer, we'll sing number 248. 248. Take. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for bringing us all here this evening. And Lord, we ask that you be, uh, be with us as we uh, worship you. Help us to uh, have you in our thoughts tonight, Lord, as we, uh, we learn more about you and how, how to uh, be better Christians. Be with those that can't be with us tonight, Lord. Watch over each one of them, whether they're having physical problems or spiritual problems, and help them to get through whatever their issues are. And Lord, be with those that don't know you. We, we pray for those that are lost and ask that uh, you would uh, soften their hearts so that they can hear and see who you are. Be with those that are teaching tonight and help us to apply what we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to mark your hymnals to number 271, that'll be our song of encouragement after the lesson. 271. And before the lesson, we're going to sing 197.
One, two, and four. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tenderest care. In thy blessed pasture, seed us. For our use, thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. See if these words sound familiar. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him of whom they've not heard? How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they pre hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent. Does that sound familiar? That's in Romans 10 and verse 11. More than once, the apostle Paul, in writing about himself in the same sentence, used three designations. He called himself an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher. Now, one of those references is 2 Timothy 1 and verse 11, but more than once. Preachers. Some preachers are a blessing to the church and a blessing to mankind. Some are a curse to the church and a curse to mankind. What if I were to say to you tonight, whatever you and I believe about salvation, it shouldn't be based on human tradition or emotions, or denominational expectations, but it should be based on what God's Word says. If we're talking about salvation, we'd all agree with that. If we were talking about worship tonight, we would say rather than base our thinking on 
human traditions or denominational practices, we ought to base our thinking about worship on what the scriptures say. Well, let's, we did that with salvation, we do that with worship. What about with preachers? What we think about preachers or what we would expect of preachers, the way we ought to approach that is learn what the scriptures say and not have our thinking or expectations based on human traditions or denominational practices. Tonight, really, a simple title for our lesson, Questions About Preachers. Now, it's up to you, for those of you that are note takers, if you want to take notes, bless your heart, go ahead. But I'm going to be firing off a bunch of questions, and they're going to go pretty quickly. It's going to be kind of an easy going lesson, I think. And so if you'd like to have a list of those questions, maybe even a verse here and there, I'll be glad to share that with you. It won't happen within five minutes after services, but if you'll let me know, I'll get that to you. Okay? So uh, tonight, let's start with definitions. Is that okay? I guess it is. All right. All right. Number one, what does the word preacher mean? And specifically, what I'm asking is the Greek word. New Testament was written in Koine Greek. The, the Greek word from which we get our English word preacher, like when Paul said that he's an apostle and a preacher, or how can they hear without a preacher? Okay, I'm going to give you, I'm going to use a couple of sources tonight on the definitions. Neither of these sources were members of the church. One was a man by the name of Joseph Thayer. Mr. Thayer uh, had a book that's called Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. He simply takes the Greek words and gives us a meaning in English. And the other source is Mr. Vine, a V I N E. And you can, you can look these up online, they're free. I mean, there are websites you can go and see these. And Mr. Vine, his is called Expo uh, Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. Same thing, he takes the Greek word. So Mr. Thayer says this word from which we get our word preacher. It's interesting. He said, a herald, H-E-R-A-L-D, a messenger vested with public authority who conveyed the official messages of kings, magistrates, princes, military commanders, or who gave a public summons or demand and performed other duties. So, so in general, it was a word that was used that somebody who spoke on behalf of a person in authority and he presented that message. Maybe it's from the king or some um, military commander. And then Mr. Thayer says in the New Testament, it's the proclaimer of the divine word. So that's, again, that's a Greek word for preacher. Mr. Vine says that Greek word means a herald. It's a preacher of the gospel. Okay, preacher of the gospel. Now, the second, second question. Well, what about the word evangelist? Now, that word evangelist in singular or plural form in, in English is found in, in our New Testament Bibles three times. Evangelist singular, evangelist plural. One is Acts 21 and verse 8 where, where someone is mentioned and is identified as Philip the evangelist. Okay? A second reference with the word evangelist is 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5, where Paul's message to Timothy was, do the work of an evangelist. And the third reference to the word evangelist in English is uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And, and speaking about the roles that Jesus gave, it says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So, so those are the references where you find the word Evangelist. Well, what does that mean? Well, according to Mr. Thayer, the word, the Greek word means a bringer of good tidings, an evangelist. Mr. Vine says literally a messenger of good denotes a preacher of the gospel. The word gospel simply meant good news. And if we were to, to look at the English spelling of that Greek word for gospel, and put it side by side or above the, the English spelling of the Greek word for evangelist, you'd see it's almost exactly the same except for the last couple of letters. So gospel, good news, evangelist was a proclaimer 
of the good news. Or as you see from those definitions in, in simple language, a preacher of the gospel was an evangelist. Now the word evangelist has this notation. It always involves good news. Okay, a preacher may have bad news, but an evangelist, he's got good news. Now, here's a concept, and I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, but there, there's a common concept in the world, let me say, among mankind, sometimes in the church, sometimes out, that if a person is, is working as a preacher and he basically works with one congregation, he's a preacher. And if he preaches at, at multiple places, kind of like a circuit preacher, he's an evangelist. And if he goes overseas, he's a missionary. Uh, I, I'm a preacher. And, and what, regardless of your location, a preacher is a preacher, and an evangelist is an evangelist. Okay, now, we're out of the definitions, okay? Everybody more comfortable now, relaxed? Okay, number three, what message should a preacher proclaim. Not long ago on Wednesday evenings in our midweek study here in the auditorium, we were doing overviews of the book of 1 Timothy, overview of the book of 2 Timothy, overview of the book of Titus. And we observed together that those men, Titus and, and Timothy, were, were evangelists. They're not, they're not designated as pastors. They're designated as evangelists or, or gospel preachers. And one of the things that Paul said to Timothy was, preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, 5, do the work of an evangelist. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, three verses in front of that, preach the word. What Well, in the context, what's the word? The word of God. What did we learn from Titus 2 and verse 1 in that overview of the book of Titus? Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And so, so an evangelist or gospel preacher has the duty to preach the message of the gospel or preach God's word. Uh, when Timothy received that first letter, we know as the book of 1 Timothy, a simple verse, but it's really powerful, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 11, these things command and teach. So, so teach the inspired message that comes from God. Number four, I'm not gonna give you the numbers later on when we get up there a little bit higher. Okay, number four. Is a preacher the same as an elder or pastor? In other words, in Bible language, is a preacher a pastor and a pastor a preacher? Well, you know the concept in the world uh, that, that they're the same. Well, biblically speaking, no. By definition, a preacher evangelist is one who proclaims the good news. By definition, the word pastor simply means shepherd, okay? You remember I mentioned in Ephesians 4 and verse 11 there, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor. You see the distinction? Some are evangelists, some are pastors. There's a distinction. In Acts 20 and verse 28, we read as Paul was speaking to the elders from the church in Ephesus, he said, you take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, pastors, who form the pastorship or eldership or shepherdship, their role is to oversee and rule over a congregation. Evangelists do not have that authority. And so there's a biblical distinction between those who serve as pastors and those who serve as evangelists. Now, as a side note, it's not on my list. I'm going rogue here a little bit, okay? I'm going off, off track, off script. Is it possible that one could serve as a pastor and as a preacher? The answer is yes. A brother who is scripturally qualified to serve as an elder and the congregation wants him to serve in that capacity, he could be both a gospel preacher and an elder, but the words don't mean the same thing and the roles are different. Next question. Are modern day preachers prophets of God? Now, I've heard some members of the church proclaim themselves to be prophets, and the answer is no. A prophet of God in the Bible, whether you're talking about in the Old Testament, New Testament, was always speaking about someone who received his message from God in a miraculous way. Preachers of the gospel are given the task to 
present to mankind what already has been revealed. And so in modern times, there are no genuine prophets because when you got a prophet, you're talking about getting a new revelation from God and you're talking about getting that message miraculously. Modern day preachers are not getting a new revelation from God. It's our task to do what? Preach that truth that God's already given to us. And so we're not getting new messages in a miraculous fashion. We're, we're presenting the message that comes from the scriptures. Well, what is the work of a gospel preacher slash evangelist? Well, again, going back to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5, do the work, there's something to be done, do the work of an evangelist. Three verses in front of that, preach the word. And so there is the public proclamation of the word. But, but as you look at the New Testament messengers of God, including the apostles, and I know that, that apostles and, and, and preachers are distinct, and yet apostles were preachers of the gospel. Um, you look at what Paul did, for example, when he wrote to, to the church in Thessalonica and reminded them about how he had dealt with them in the past, he said, like a father does with his children, he said, I charged and comforted and exhorted every one of you. Again, that's 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11. And so part of the role of an evangelist is to exhort. In fact, if you look at the entire verse of 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be it's an in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There's a concept, and I get where it's coming from, but there's a concept in, in the church today where language is used that so and so is the pulpit preacher. Well, I, I just want to be a preacher. I don't want to be designated as, as a one-place preacher because when you study the books of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, you, you learn that in addition to their public proclamation, there was also privately working with people. Again, 1 Timothy 4.11, these things command and teach. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, Paul said to Timothy, the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so one of the roles of an evangelist is to take what he knows, take what he knows how to do and, and work with other Christians and train them so that they can do the same thing. That, that's not publicly preaching at a pulpit, but it's training members. It's exhorting members. And you see the picture of the apostles. D did they preach in the temple publicly? Yes, but they also preached house to house. And so a gospel preacher is one who proclaims the message publicly, but he's also involved in edifying the church and in training members and is also reaching out to the lost. Number seven, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna quit giving the numbers. What should be the proper motive for preaching? That's a fair question. What should be the proper motive for preaching? In other words, why does someone take on that task? Well, is there such a thing as a not so good motive? Uh, uh, yeah, I could think of some. There might be someone who maybe feels some kind of pressure. I mean, all he's heard for his whole life is his great-granddaddy was a gospel preacher, his granddaddy was a gospel preacher, and his dad was a gospel preacher. Now, Johnny, Johnny the fourth, aren't you going to be a preacher? That's, that's all he's heard his whole life. And so he has within him this sense of, well, that's what's expected. Do you want to do it? No. Do you love it? No. Well, don't do it then. So that, that'd be a wrong motive, okay? That desire to please someone else. Someone might take on the role of being a gospel preacher because you know, a fellow's got to live. You've got to have an income somewhere, and so I'll just take this until I find something I like or something better that comes along. Well, that's not, a, that's not the right motive for taking on the role of, of a gospel preacher. It's, a gospel preacher's attitude is, should not be, I preach in order to live, but I live in order to preach. What would be... A proper motive then. Well, the first verse we use tonight 
How shall they hear without a preacher? And that whole thing started, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it ends up with, how shall they hear without a preacher? And then it goes on to say, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The proper motive for being an evangelist is a concern for lost souls. Wanting to help lost souls learn the way to heaven and wanting to work with the church to build it up so it can be the kind of people God wants it to be. Next question. What does the Bible say about the kind of conduct the Lord expects of a preacher? In other words, in biblical language, what does God expect when it comes to a preacher's personal conduct? Now, if you're a note taker, unless you are the fastest in the world, I I wouldn't try to write this down. Made myself a little list some time back went through the book of 1 Timothy. And then I was on a roll, I went to 2 Timothy. And then I was on a roll, I went into Titus. So I I looked in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, these letters written to gospel preachers, and I came up with a list. Now, I may have missed some. So these that I have here, it at least involves these. And and what you're gonna see is, in a lot of ways, what would be expected of a a gospel preacher be the same thing that's expected of of common Joe and plain Jane, in other words, just ordinary Christians, like we all are. I'm not gonna give you the verse references. Again, if you'd like to have this, I'd be glad to share it with you. Absolutely free. Don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. War a good warfare. Hold the faith. Hold a good conscience. Pray. Know how to conduct yourself in the house of God. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Be an example. Meditate on these things. Take heed unto yourself. Treat, your, uh, treat older brothers like you would your dad. And I'm paraphrasing. Treat older women like you would your mom. Treat younger brothers like you would your brother. Treat older uh, younger sisters like you would your own sister. Don't prefer one another before another. Do nothing by partiality. Do not be partaker of or share in other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. Flee these things. That's the love of money. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Keep what God commands without spot and unrebukable. Keep that which is committed to your trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings. Do not be fearful. Be strong. Endure hardness as a good soldier of the Christ. Be diligent to rightly divide the word. Flee youthful lust. Follow or pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. Avoid foolish and ignorant questions. Do not strive or quarrel. Be apt or able to teach. Be gentle unto all men. Be patient. Be meek or humble. Watch in all things. Endure afflictions. Show yourself as a pattern of good works. Have sound speech that cannot be condemned. Let no man despise you. Avoid foolish questions or disputes and genealogies, contentions and strivings. How many did you come up with? 39 on my list. Now again, I may have missed some. But if you're looking for God's answer to what is expected in the personal conduct of gospel preachers, don't go to the minutes of a 1977 business meeting. Go to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And again, in principle, whatever's expected of all Christians in terms of their their, their speech and their attitude and their action, that'd be expected of a gospel preacher. Is a preacher required to be married? Is a preacher allowed to be married? You and I know when we look at the specifics of the qualifications for bishops, he's got to be the husband of of one wife, 1 Timothy 3, 2. That's not a requirement for one who is a gospel preacher. Is it allowed? Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5, we read that that Paul asks a question, don't we have the right to lead about a sister, a wife, like Cephas does? Peter was a married man, he was a gospel preacher. Okay, is it a requirement to be married? No, you know, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 7, it sure sounds like, as he said to the brethren, maybe it'd be good for you to remain like I am. The implication is, 
Paul was an unmarried person. Well, which preachers are better, married or unmarried? It, 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 there's no better in that case. Some choose to be one, some choose to be the other. Okay? Next question. Should we idolize preachers and blindly follow whatever they say? And somebody says, well, it depends on who they are. No, it doesn't depend on who they are. Should we idolize preachers and blindly follow what they say? You remember that instance when Cornelius came to where Peter was and he bowed down to worship him? What did Peter say? He said, you stand up. He said, I myself also am a man. You don't do that. Acts 10, 25 and 26. Are preachers capable of leading people astray? They sure are. And so we owe it to ourselves. Anytime we read what a preacher has said or we hear him in person or hear him online, check it out with what the Word of God says. No, we don't idolize them and we don't follow what they say regardless. Should a preacher visit the sick and visit hospitals? Well, Jesus said on the day of judgment or the time when he comes and separates people, he said one of the factors is going to be, he said, when folks are sick and folks are in prison and folks are clothesless and don't have food, he says, I'm going to say to some of those people, I was hungry and you fed me. I didn't have clothes, you gave me clothes. I was sick and you visited me. Matthew 24, and I'm sorry, Matthew 25 and verse 36. Well, would a preacher be expected to visit the sick and, and those who are hurting? Why, of course, but not because he's a preacher, because he's a follower of Jesus. And that's what followers of Jesus do. Next question. Should we expect a preacher to do all the work of a congregation? You know, I've heard of, of a situation where a congregation was, was doing pretty well. They didn't have a, a full-time preacher. The members were pitching in and doing the work, and they were taking turns in different aspects of the work, the teaching and the preaching and in other areas of the work. And, and then they got a preacher, and then all of a sudden, the work the other members did came to, what do we call it, a screeching halt. Because their thought was, now we got a full-time preacher, and let him do it all. Now, a lot of congregations, I'm thankful Greens Lake Road is one of them, a lot of congregations do not have that mindset. But some Christians have that idea that, well, we got a preacher, let him do it. We got a preacher, what, what do we got him for? What are we paying him for? No, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That was a message not written specifically to evangelists, but to the Christians in the church in Corinth, and so the Lord's work is for all of God's people. Next question, does a preacher only work a few hours per week, like on Sunday and, and for midweek Bible study? Well, there are more than a few people who have that concept. Now, is it possible that a person is uh, working a secular job, and, and because of his commitment to that job and, and the time invested, that he's limited in, in the work he can do outside of the public assembly? I could see that scenario. But when a gospel preacher is functioning as a gospel preacher, he's doing more than presenting public lessons. He better be preparing for those lessons. And as much as he can, working with new converts, working to build up the members, training the members, doing, you know, maybe doing some things in writing, or doing whatever he can. And so if a preacher is doing what he needs to be doing, no, he's not a four hour a, work, a week worker. Okay, is it scriptural for a preacher to be called by religious titles? You know, that's pretty common, isn't it? Well, in Matthew chapter 23, we read that Jesus was, was speaking about this. He said, you know, there are some folks, he said they love the, the best seats at the feast. They love the chief seats in the synagogues. They love the greetings in the markets and they love to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, which is like the, the, top, the, the top teacher. He says, but don't you be called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and, and you're all brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth 
For one is your Father who's in heaven. Don't be called master, for one is your master or teacher, even Christ. And that's in Matthew 23, 6 through 10 or 11. And so the point Jesus was getting was he didn't want his followers to have religious titles, okay? It's not that, uh, like, like to call someone a pastor, that's not a religious title. It's a description of the role he plays. To call someone an evangelist, it's not a title, it's a description of the role that he plays. And so is it scriptural to have religious titles like, like rev, reverend? Well, the answer is no, okay? Is it scriptural if a preacher labors with only one local church? Some of y'all are looking kind of groggy, so let's turn to this one, okay? Let's turn to Matthew 18. Just saying. Did I say Matthew 18? I'm so sorry. Acts 18. Acts 18. Is it scriptural for a preacher to labor with only one local church? I don't mean for his whole life, but I mean at, at one period of time. He said, this is where I'm working. Is that scripture? Well, look in your Bible in Acts 18. It's talking about Paul in the city of Corinth. And I know in Mississippi it's Corinth. Okay, I know that. Okay. But here it's Corinth. Look what your Bible says in verse number 11. It's talking about Paul. Verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So, so for those 18 months, Paul was a located preacher in the city of Corinth. Now, you, you may be familiar with this, you may not, but there are some brethren who don't think it's scriptural for a gospel preacher to work in one place with a designated congregation. They, they, they say located preachers is unscriptural. Well, Paul was there for 18 months. Now, what if Instead of staying there 18 months, he stayed there 28 months. Some of us say, I think 28 months would be good. 29 would be unscriptural. But there's no way for humans by our peewee wisdom to be able to make those decisions. We're not saying it's a requirement, but if a fellow could stay there for two days, why couldn't he stay there for 22 why couldn't he stay there for two months or two years? And so the idea that it's unscriptural to stay in one place or work with one congregation, that, that the scriptures don't teach that. Well, next question. What if, a, is it scriptural if a preacher labors with more than one congregation? Look at your Bible in Acts 14. Acts 14. Here's Paul's first recorded preaching trip. He's with Barnabas. And they've gone to several different places um, look in your Bible there. They, they've gone, let me just mention, then we'll come back to the names. They've gone on the mainland there in what we call Turkey. They've gone to Antioch. They've gone to Iconium. They've gone to Lystra. And they've gone to Derby. those four places. Well, look in your Bible there in verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, that's Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. What's the picture you see here? You see Paul and Barnabas investing time and working with Antioch, the church in Antioch, the brethren in Iconium, the brethren in Lystra, and the brethren in Derby. Now, in this case, the Bible doesn't tell us how long they stayed at each junction. But they worked in, in a limited period of time with more than one congregation. So is it scriptural for a gospel preacher to work with only one congregation? It is. Is it scriptural for a gospel preacher to work with more than one congregation? It is. And, and, and brethren from other congregations who observe that, they may have something to say about that. But you know, really, it's none of their business. It's none of their business to tell three or four congregations whether they ought to have somebody come there on a circuit program or whether somebody will be there all the time. That's none of their business because of our autonomy. Next question, you say, Brother Campbell, is there any end in sight on your list yeah, I got five more. 
You got five? You got, you can hear five more, right? Okay. Number 17. Is it scriptural if a congregation has more than one preacher working with it? Look in Acts 11. Acts 11. The, the gospel had gone to Antioch of Syria. And it's there that the disciples first were called Christians. Well, in that connection, it's speaking about uh, Barnabas. Look in verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he, Barnabas, had found him, Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they, plural, Saul and Barnabas, assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. According to verse 26, you've got teachers by the name of Saul and Barnabas working with one congregation. So number one, you've got them with one church. And number two, you've got a plurality of teachers or a plurality of preachers. And over in chapter 13, in verse number one, the Bible says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So you've got multiple teachers, you've got multiple prophets, so you've got multiple messengers in one congregation. Now somebody else may look at that and put their hand on their hip and say, not fair. Congregations um, have different sizes in terms of members. Congregations have different needs. Congregations have different manpower. And so each individual congregation has to decide for itself, um, do we want someone working with us as a teacher, as a gospel preacher on a regular basis? And do we want multiples? And they have the right to have multiples if they so desire. Well, somebody says, well, look, in, in, this, in this county, there, there's seven congregations, and four of us don't even have preachers in that other congregation. they got three preachers. Not fair. It's an individual congregation's decision. Okay. Next question. Is it scriptural for a preacher to receive material or financial compensation for his work? Well, I'll just mention a passage in 1 Corinthians 9, about verses 6 to 14 in that ballpark. Paul talks about this, uh, this topic. And he makes reference to something that the Lord Jesus said. And he said, even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel which is a, a, a reference, a general reference to what Jesus had said, that a laborer is what? Worthy of his hire. And one of the references that Paul uses here, he goes back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy and said, you know, under the Old Covenant, when you had an animal out there who was walking over the grain, stamping out the grain, right, in a threshing floor, what was the animal allowed to do? He was allowed to pig out. <laughs> he, he was allowed to eat. So he'd have the, the energy and motivation to work. And, and Paul says, you know, I'm not just talking about animals here. He said, and so he makes the application. And so it is scriptural for a gospel preacher to receive financial compensation for the work he does. Three left, y'all. Doesn't that sound good? Now, this is not, this is my least liked question on this list. And when you hear it and, and the answer, you'll know why. What are areas in which some preachers struggle? You know, Christ, our preachers are like other Christians in the sense that they have to practice self-control. They have to overcome the, the, the pull of the flesh and the pull of the world. Just because they, they work as a preacher does not mean they're exempt from those things. 
So what would be included in the areas where some preachers struggle? Some gospel preachers struggle with pride. And in some cases, you don't have to listen to them or be around them very long till you recognize that. And it's disgusting. Some preachers struggle with envy. They're envious of other gospel preachers who, whom they perceive to have it much better than they do in some way. Some gospel preachers struggle in their interaction with females. They make inappropriate choices. Some gospel preachers struggle as financial stewards. To say they're not very good with their money is saying it lightly. Sometimes they're thieves. Some gospel preachers struggle with laziness. And so just whatever might be said that, that other Christians might struggle with, gospel preachers can, can face the same things. Two more questions. Now, this, this next one may sound, huh? Does a gospel preacher have the right to have close friends in the church, have his own personal hobbies, or buy his own house? You say, well, where does that kind of question come from? We have a friend who's a gospel preacher who told another friend who's a gospel preacher. His recommendation was don't ever become close friends with the Christians. It, it, it'll, it'll hurt your work. And so our other friend asked us, what's your take on that? I said, don't pay any attention to that. It, it ought to be natural for a gospel preacher to have friends like anybody else, to have hobbies like anybody else if they want to pursue them. What about have their own house? Well, Philip had a house. Now, I'm not saying just because Philip did it, that, that that's, that's the way it ought to be for all gospel preachers. But he had a house. Acts 21, Paul said, we stopped over and went into and stayed in his house. And so I guess the, the gist of that answer and that question is, gospel preachers are, are no different from, from other people in a lot of ways. Final question, number 21. Is it possible for a congregation to be sound and strong if it does not have a full-time gospel preacher? The answer is yes. You, you, you may not be aware of this. And I wouldn't have any idea the, the, the exact number. I would guess in the world there are thousands of congregations that don't have a full-time gospel preacher. You say, well, how do they survive, number one? And number two, can they be sound in the faith and can they be strong? Uh, the answer is, it, it is possible to be strong. It, it is possible to be sound in the faith. I, I've got a, a congregation in mind that uh, they have two elders and two deacons and, and the elders preach every month and the deacons preach every month and in addition, those elders and deacons, I wrote down a list today of at least nine brothers, in addition to the elders and deacons, at least nine brothers ages 30 and under who are in a weekly or in, in a monthly or quarterly teaching rotation. That's 13 brothers in that congregation. They, they don't need somebody to come in and start doing what they've been doing effectively. And that's a congregation that has about 40 in attendance on Sunday. You say, Brother Campbell, are you suggesting that no congregations have, have full-time preachers? Because if so, you ain't got a job. The question was, is it scriptural? Is it possible for a congregation to be sound and strong without a full-time preacher? And the answer is yes. And so a gospel preacher is not a what? Certainly not a savior. His role is not to take on the work that, that everybody could be doing together. Uh, so those are 21. I didn't tell you until the very end. I'd scare you to death. Those are 21 questions about preachers. And so again, you know, our, our appeal would be, and it makes sense, whatever our concept of preachers is, whatever our expectation for preachers is, it ought to be based on what the Bible says and not what some denomination practices. 
or not what some preacher did 40 years ago or, or 80 years ago. Tonight, we've not talked at all about what's required in order to become a Christian. As I look over this assembly tonight, I know that everyone here understands what that is. Maybe there's someone here tonight as a child of God who needs the prayers of the church. Brother Bob has selected a song. If you need to respond, would you come as you stand and we sing together? I keep Jesus waiting, waiting. Why did my Savior come to earth and to bring up Why did he choose a lonely bird? Because he loved me so. God, as we are partaking of this Lord's Supper, help us to remember the bread, which is a representation of the flesh that was broken on the cross, and help us to uh, train our thoughts upon those events. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear God, as we continue to partake of the Lord's Supper, we know we pray in a like manner for the cup, a representation of Jesus' blood. We know that many cruel things happened to him on the cross and on the way to the cross, and that he gave his life for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Help us to remember those events. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
And dear God, as we pray for this uh, giving, this time where we give back as we have prospered, help us to do so in a manner that is well-pleasing to you and with a heart that is uh, willful and cheerful. In Christ we pray. Amen. Turn to number 276. 276. Sing one verse of this song and then be dismissed in prayer. Oh, land of rest for Father, we're so thankful for the day that we've had to come together as a people to worship Thee, Father, in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank Thee so much for this time and this building that we have to come together as Your people to, to worship Thee. Father, we thank You so much for the congregation here at Greens Lake Road and for the members who are present and those who may be watching. Father, we pray You'll be with those who are a number who are sick and shut in at this time, that You'll be with them and restore them, Heavenly Father, if they're health and that they're able to come back to us. Be with the shut-ins, Father, that they know that we're thinking about them at this time and, and that, Father, you will comfort them as only you can. Father, we also pray that you go with us through this next week, that we'll take your word with us, that our light will shine as such, that others may see your good works in us. And Father, we thank thee so much for the leadership here at Greens Lake Road, our elders who lead this congregation, for the deacons who serve, for Brother Roger who brings us the bread of life. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless them as only you can and their families. And Father, we pray as we prepare to leave that you'll take us safely to our homes and bring us back to the next appointed hour. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>